Hello, everyone, and yes, welcome to yet another exciting episode of Avatar, the podcast. Comic edition. Comic edition. We are so excited to be starting up the, in my mind, I don't know if this is the same for you, Acorn, but in my mind, by the way, I'm Booster Greg, that's Acorn Bandit. Hello. Let's get to what I want to what I want to say here. I feel like these last three books, so The Promise, The Search, and The Rift, are like part of their own trilogy. And this feels like mm-hmm. very much so we're coming to the end of something. Yeah, it does. I feel like a little emotional about it. I know. It's also like with every new trilogy of these comics, I feel like I'm getting more and more story of the world that, like I've said before, I've never had before. Mm-hmm. Like... It's filling in so many things for me, and I'm enjoying this so, so much. Absolutely, absolutely. I was actually a little nervous starting up the Rift because the search was so good. Mm -hmm. In my mind, the Rift cannot top the search because of how much I enjoyed it. It actually, I enjoyed the search so much. We didn't talk about this last episode, but I enjoyed it so much that the promise actually got knocked down a peg for me. Ah. (laughs) Because I rem- uh-huh. remember like we were singing his praises and then now that I'm thinking about it afterwards and when I'm live on Twitch and people are asking me about the comics, I'm like, yeah, the promise is good. But the search, that's the bread and butter right there. <laughs> so now we have to see if the team can top it I know. with the rift. If they can top it. If they can top it. <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump into the rift part one, let's read some five star reviews. Yeah, let's do it. The first one comes from Avatar William and Avatar William writes, amazing. Hi, this podcast is the best and it takes my breath away with like a wind emoji or poof emoji. Yep. <laughs> to me, that's a fart emoji, but that's just a whole other, a whole other kit gaboodle. It's multi-purpose. Just don't put a peach in front of it. And I guess it's not a fart one anymore. Anyways, you guys <laughs> really go with flow wave and there's a little wave emoji. You are on fire. And again, a fire emoji. <laughs> and I can't think of a lame pun for earth bending. That's rock solid. You don't have to. <laughs> but seriously, great podcast. And I hope you guys do the Cora comics as well. Ratings. We get a top 10 actually from Avatar William. Ooh. Yep. Avatar William says number one, Ang. Number two, Katara. Number three, Iro. Number four, Toph. Number five, Zuko. Number six, Cabbage Merchant. I'm getting slower as I realize that Sokka is not in this list. Number seven, Momo. Number eight, Jet. Number nine, Ozai. And finally, number 10, Azula. Wow. Avatar William hates Sokka and he hates you, Greg. I'm sure it is number 11. I'm sure of it. Not a doubt <laughs> in my mind. So here's, this is where it gets a little awkward with this review. Avatar William wrote, I hope to have my review read during the promise part three. Well, better late Oops. than never, my friend. Yep. We do get to these in chronological order. So just missed the cut. Just missed it. But. I think it's better to be, have a review read maybe on the first of a new series than the last. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Now for some sub-bending puns. The action makes my blood boil. You guys are tough as metal. And you guys give me chills, which are multiplying and electrifying. Lots of love, Avatar William. <laughs> Thank you so much, Avatar William. That was great. It was a long one. Oh, geez. I didn't realize that was that long. Thank you so much for taking the time to leave that. We super appreciate it. Off to your puns. Mm -hmm. Our next review comes from Alex Schwartz, who writes, My fiance has a bone to pick with Greg. (laughs) Hi, Greg and Acorn. Started listening to the podcast after I rediscovered my love for Avatar recently. I was craving more content and this podcast has hit the spot. I've binged every episode in two weeks. I would totally recommend it to a friend. It will most definitely be an avid listener going forward. The only problem is that since I started listening to the pod, I will randomly burst out with the secret tunnel, (laughs) secret Secret tunnel tunnel at the top of my lungs. (laughs) And I have now started to enter in random words instead of tunnel, as Greg is wont to do now and again. I'm worried that my wedding will be called off if I don't stop. (laughs) Any advice on how to not do that constantly would be great. Thanks. I do have some advice to not do that constantly. I can't guarantee your fiance won't leave you if you follow this. but. What I do is I find an even better, in parentheses, more annoying, in parentheses, <laughs> song. So right now, I have the Hippopotamus song stuck in my head. The Hippopotamus song? Yeah. So Oscar Isaac a couple months ago was on Jimmy Fallon, and he shared a anecdote of how he sings this song to his kids. 
Alto. I won't sing it oh, now because no. everyone got sick of me singing it on my last stream. <laughs> so if you want to know what it is, Alec, you can probably just Google it and find Oscar Isaac's rendition, which is a lot better than mine. But it is on that same level. You just replace it with a different song. Long story short, that's was what you do. There's no other way to do it. By the way, Alec, if you find a way to do it, let me know because help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Alec, for leaving that wonderful five-star review and giving me a mild heart attack when I read the subject line. Just a mild <laughs> one. The next one comes from Bowmaster, and Bowmaster writes, amazing podcast. I come from the podcast music app that shall not be named, which probably Spotify, I would assume. Just a side note. <laughs> and I wanted to tell you that this is a top tier podcast, and the hosts compliment each other, and the show is ang amazing. My tier list of characters are number one, Sokka. Redeemed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. A person of taste, I see. Well done. Number two, Iroh. Number three, Toph. Number four, Zuko. Number five, Long Fang, of all people. Ooh. Interesting. That's a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. I love this top five. This is really good. This is. This is great. And Sokka is where he should be at number one. <laughs> Also loving the Aang Amazing and the Toph tier. Yes. Yes, it's catching on. Bowmaster, thank you so much for leaving that amazing five-star review and taking that extra step. We know that the music app you listen to may or may not have written reviews, just the, the numerical ratings. So thank you. We appreciate it. Our next review comes from Mike Ostan, who writes, love this podcast continuation. Sorry for the long review. I also love the MVP and moral of the story at the end of each episode. Thank you so much for bringing this podcast to life, and I can't wait to hear more. FYI, my top five characters are number five, Suki, number four, Katara, number three, Aang, number two, May, and number one, Suko. Thank you so much for updating your review, Mako Stan, and letting us know your top five and what you love about the show. We super appreciate that. Like we've said it a couple times before, and I think by a couple, I mean we we're talking everyone's ear off about it. But whenever mm -hmm. anyone leaves any feedback about the show itself, too, like that's super appreciated or leaves a review as if someone else was going to be reading it and not just a letter to Acorn and I like we love mm -hmm. all of that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Another review comes from the dog is on fire. I hope not. Huh? Concerning. Kind of concerning, but OK, we'll move on. They write, Love it. This podcast is amazing. I started listening at the beginning of book three. You make my boring day 10 times better. People all around me tell me that Avatar is a kid show. When I found this podcast, I rubbed it in their faces. <laughs> My top five characters are Appa, the cabbage merchant, Zuko, Uncle Iroh, and Momo. Love you two so much. And that's in all parentheses with three exclamation marks at the end. All capitals. All capitals. Thank you so much. This dog is on fire or the dog is on fire. I hope you find a fire extinguisher relatively quickly. <laughs> Our second to last review comes from A. Caballeros who writes, a podcast Iroh would be proud of. Oh gosh, I hope so. I've listened to many Avatar podcasts as it's something I never get tired of speaking or hearing about, and this is above and beyond the best one. The fact that you are so thorough in your research while also being somewhat new to some material is astounding. I thought I knew almost everything, but you both find a way to teach me new things every time. You both have amazing chemistry as hosts, and I appreciate the effort of both of you and anyone that may be in the back. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I'd rank the elements as fire, air, water, and earth. And my favorite characters are Iroh, Tai Li, Sokka, Suki, and Azula. By a slight margin, Acorn plus Greg is greater than Barney plus Bosco. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> I don't agree, but I thank you for the thought and for saying so. We appreciate your opinion. Thank I you. very much appreciate that. When I read that, I got very like nervous all of a sudden. I don't know why. <laughs> just like, ah! oh no, that's so nice. Uh, I do want to take a quick note. This next review comes from Grant Devries. I won't read the whole thing because Grant previously left a review and we did read it, but Grant updated his review to let us know that he caught up to the podcast. Oh, good. So that's super exciting. And thank you so much, Grant, for letting us know that he caught up. And we're proud of you. Thanks. It's great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, so much. Mm -hmm. And as far as the podcast comparison, the good thing about podcasts is the more you listen to, the better your life is. That's true. So if you listen to Raving the Elements and our podcast, amazing. Ang amazing. You're getting so much Avatar information from behind the scenes to fan theories to puns. 
I don't know. I interviews. Don't know. Interviews. You know, they have the interviews and the That's right. first person recollections. That's right. Yeah. I loved the episode with Jack DeSena in it. It was so good. It was so, so good. It's like my favorite so far. All right. Well, let's get started. This is going to be the Rift Part 1, or as we like to call it, Polluted Traditions. That's right. We start the issue at the city of Yudao, where Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Toph meet up with Iroh right before the announcement of the colony's new government. We learn that Zuko is unable to attend this ceremony because remember how I said we're like in an RPG situation, this is like Final Fantasy, and we can't possibly have like more characters than a certain number. Well, it stays true here because we're tagging Zuko out and we're bringing Toph with us. <laughs> it's a four-person party. Tops. That's right. That's right. Zuko is actually for real, though, unable to attend because he is supporting his mother, and her family at Capital City, which yeah, is really nice. That was so nice. I know. It was a nice little aside. So so Ursa and her family, which I'm thinking is also Ikem, mm -hmm. are going to the Capitol to visit for the first time since her banishment. I hope they will never do this, but I hope they bring Ikem over to see Ozai and so you can just laugh at him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nerd. <laughs> you would never do that. And actually, I don't want to do that because I feel like somehow Ozai would actually kill Ikem. For real? He would hire like an assassin out of the jail. Somehow, yeah. yeah. Somehow. Something would happen. Well, we learn that Iroh was actually happy to help his nephew by filling in from the events of the search as what an interim fire lord, I guess you would call him, and is even happier that his favorite and new holiday, National Tea Day, was a success. But Iroh does mention that he misses his shop in Ba Sing Se and will be returning there shortly. The conversation is interrupted when Corey appears and announces the new government, which is composed of four people, two Earth Kingdom and two Fire Nation representatives. Toph doubts that this new government will work, but Aang assures her that the colony will make it work since they are the example. After the announcement, everyone moves inside for the banquet. Aang notices that there is a hooded air nomad figure waving to him from across the hall. Aang immediately asks Jing Ying if one of the air acolytes is late, but she tells the Avatar that everyone is present and accounted for. Aang politely rushes through the crowd to find the hooded figure, but after a few brushes with the attendees, he takes to the sky and air walks over everyone, which is a little less polite. When Aang finally catches up to the hooded figure, she is revealed to be none other than Avatar Yang Chen, who tries to tell Aang something, but the words don't form. After Aang tells his former self that he can't hear anything she is saying, she disappears. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Something's afoot mysterious. here. Very mysterious. Uh -huh. Detail about the art, actually. Have you noticed that this episode, this issue, seems to be more detailed in the way that the panels are drawn? I wanted to say this. Yes, I 100% saw that. I also saw that everyone's taller, much taller. <laughs> yes, exactly. Gurihiru was able to not only pack in more detail in these panels, but also depict the gang as older. So yeah, they're taller, they're looking more mature, mm -hmm. closer to their adult selves that we're going to see in Korra. But it was something that just stood out to me as like a visual detail. I didn't notice any notes about a different process that they had used for this comic. Although something I haven't mentioned before is the search part two was actually the first issue that was done entirely digitally. Oh. So either Gurihiru is more comfortable with digital and it's just a lot more detailed and looks more natural now, or they switched back to paper and ink. But either way, I was so impressed with the quality of this art. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was really good. The colors were very soft, I felt. And I like how they trick you a little bit, especially with this hooded figure, because when you see her, she looks like a person. She's not in a spirit form or anything else. But from here on out, whenever you see her, she's a little more spirity, which is really neat. Yeah. Well, back at the feast, Sokka attempts to convince the vegetarian air acolytes to eat some turtle duck because, well, he's Sokka and he's <laughs> enjoying something and he wants everyone else to enjoy it. I very much relate to that on a personal level. <laughs> I'm like, I really like this. You should have this. I don't like it. I don't care. Eat it. It's so good. <laughs> I could totally see that. Oh, man. Uh, Katara asks Toph how her metal bending school is going. And Toph explains that there are so many new students that she had to resort to building earth tents outside for them to sleep in. Sokka suggests that she charge tuition, but Toph refuses, since her school is something more important than a business. 
Gitaru realizes that Aang is not at the table and goes off in search for her sweetie. And they're still using that term. And it is still driving me up a wall, <laughs> which is the point, which is very good. But still, Katara eventually finds Aang on the balcony, attempting to connect with Avatar Yang Chen through meditation using his prayer beads. Although Katara recognizes that while meditating is very important, she reminds Aang that the celebrations are also important to his role as the Avatar. These words remind Aang of an old Air Nomad celebration, and he returns to the party and announces to the Air Acolytes and his friends that they would be going off on a field trip. Sokka is disappointed since he wanted to go shopping in Yudao because he's Sokka. <laughs> uh-huh. Because he's Sokka. Mm-hmm. Here is an actual art detail that I found out. Some fun trivia. When the team draws food, they actually don't draw the food itself until the coloring stage. What they do is they draw empty plates until the inking stage and then later add the food. So if you look closer at the panels, you can actually see that the food doesn't have any outlines. It looks like it's just color on color painted. Oh, yeah. And that's why. Another detail is in the background. Did you notice the glowing crystals on the pillars? I did, yeah. Yeah, so fun reminder, Ba Sing Se's major resource is the glowing crystals that come from the crystal catacombs underground. From the time when Ba Sing Se used to be an underground city and they were mining their way through the catacombs, through the rock, and they discovered the crystals. That's so cool. So cohesion. I love it. Yeah. The next morning, the gang and the air acolytes make their way to a sacred air nomad site with the help of Appa, of course, which is like kind of weird because now we have the four plus three additional people. And I feel like Appa is just very tired at this point. Like, why wouldn't he be? Unless they're very light. I don't know. Uh, I felt bad for yeah. Appa on this one. <laughs> I was like, seven people? <laughs> Appa, so sorry. I mean, with Sokka filled with so much meat, he probably counts as two people. That's fair. Aang explains that this sacred site is where they would celebrate Yang Chen's festivals, which is one of the most important Air Nomad holidays, which also hasn't been celebrated in over 100 years, which makes sense because Aang disappeared 100 years ago. Toph and Katara note how eager the Air Acolytes seem, and it's like one of those weird things where they're just overly excited. Katara's just like, what's, what's their deal? What's going on? And Toph's like, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, Katara seems to understand, but they're very much like, oh my gosh, Avatar Aang, please tell us more. <laughs> tell us everything. <laughs> it's, it's cute it is it's very cute and ang gives everyone a breakdown of the celebration now i'm gonna kind of gloss over his crazy detail because there's so many different scenes and stuff going on but here's what the celebration consists of they will gather together and bow four times as a sign of respect to the giant statue they will then walk down the cliff to a secluded meadow while playing traditional air nomad music once they reach the meadow they will eat a ceremonial air nomad meal which is vegetarian, so it's basically tofu. And I'll note that Sokka and Toph are not excited about this whatsoever. <laughs> and finally, they will visit an island just off the coast and fly kites. That look like cranes, and I love the design. They're so pretty. I believe it was at this point that Aang kind of shows off one of the kites, and Katara asks, where's the string? And he's like, what do you need a string for on a kite? Which is a fun little detail. I like that. <laughs> yep. We also got a nice little flashback in there, too to Aang and Monk Yatso, which was really nice. Yeah, so nice. When the gang finally arrive at the statue, however, Sokka wonders about the identity of the statue, because that's definitely not Avatar Yang Chen, or even an air nomad, because she's missing the arrow. She's wearing like a... Yeah. She looks like a, a, a scholar or someone of intellect. Mm -hmm. Very Earth Kingdom type yes. of clothing. Yeah, it looks almost like a, a public official or something, sort of. Yeah, I get that too, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Aang admits that he does not know the identity of the woman, as Monk Gyatso never told him. We get a little flashback of Monk Gyatso saying, yeah, you'll have, I don't know why I sound like an old Jewish man right now, because yeah, you'll have time later. Don't worry about it. You're young. <laughs> that was horrible reading that. I know. Like, you didn't understand Monk Gyatso. He needs to know everything right now. Yeah. Oh, there is man. no time. And that actually really puts it into perspective, this whole comic about how Aang grew up with these traditions and this culture, but he didn't understand it to a level of an adult. So he's teaching this information secondhand to the air acolytes the best that he can. But just imagine how much is actually missing. Yeah. Probably a lot. I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, devil's advocate argument, 
if he understands the core tenets of the teachings and uses that as a foundation and basically doesn't bother with the superfluous details, then maybe it's actually better suited for this modern reinventing of the air nomad culture, you know, makes more room for them to progress and to build something new. Yeah. It's just not going to work out in favor for someone like Sokka when they start questioning everything about it and Aang can't like back it up. That's what this comic is illustrating. The fact that, you know, things like traditions are important, but you also kind of need to understand the meaning behind them. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. You can blindly follow traditions if you want, but if you don't understand why the traditions were in place, then uh, maybe it's not so great. Either way, Sokka thinks it's a little weird to be bowing to a statue when they're not sure who they're bowing to. Aang simply replies, that's just how it's done, which instantly triggers Toph. Mm-hmm. Big time. It's almost like, I don't want to, I'm going to say this very respectfully. I don't want, I'm not trying to play down anything, but it was kind of PTSD-esque for me, like going through it and seeing how she viewed her childhood and how sheltered she was and everything that she went through and it was always just this reasoning of essentially it's the parents because I said so do this because I said so do this because that's how it's done yeah I think it was definitely meant to be depicted as like a PTSD type flashback which of course with PTSD it's in a comic form you have to have the very clear visual so it was more like reconstructed scenes but I'm sure in the moment someone with PTSD wouldn't have like potentially as much detail I think it would be a huge emotional reaction. Yeah. Just like it just brings up all of the things that she's been running from since she left home. And as we're going to see, made a huge impact on her. Absolutely. So she thinks about all these things in her past, right? All these reasonings. You can't do this because that's how it's done. You can't do that because that's how it's done. You have to do it this way because that's how it's done. And she immediately refuses to bow when everyone else is bowing and basically just spits in Aang's face when he tries to convince her to participate. It's obvious that Aang gets upset by Toph's refusal, but he takes a moment to compose himself and uses the situation as a learning opportunity for the Air Acolytes, which good on you, Aang. The learning opportunity is presented as peace is at the very heart of the Air Nomad way of life. We let insults fly past us like a gentle breeze, leaving our inner peace undisturbed. Everyone minus Toph, I'm going to call her the stubborn dunderhead. Because I think it's just like, <laughs> I understand where she's coming from, but also like, I guess I'm just the kind of guy who's just like, even though I don't understand, it's going to make my friend happy, so I'll kind of do it. So everyone bows to the statue, except for Toph. The Air Acolytes are totally nerding out about the experience, while Sokka feels a bit lost since he doesn't quite understand why they're so excited, because all he did was bow to a statue. This is one of those things where I understand, I think, where Sokka is coming from. Because while I have not been in his particular shoes, if you go to see like a Marvel movie and you watched all of the Marvel movies and you go with a friend who has it and you're nerding out about an actor who hasn't been in the role forever and your friend hasn't seen that and you're sitting there nerding out and he's just like, why? That's just some actor that hasn't acted in 15 (laughs) years. (laughs) Yeah. You know, so it was like I found some nice parallels in that kind of him missing the whole point. Mm -hmm. He's also very hungry. To Sokka's defense, surprise, I'm defending Sokka. He's very hungry, I'm sure. (laughs) After bowing, Aang asks the Air Acolytes to take out their instruments and to provide traditional Air Nomad music while they walk to the meadow for their ceremonial meal, which, by the way, is most likely still tofu. Mm -hmm. And bean sprouts. And bean sprouts. Don't forget the bean sprouts. I forgot the bean sprouts. Moving through a relatively dense forest, Toph finds the noise of the cymbals to be a bit too much and metal bends them crooked to stop the noise. Toph throws a bit of a temper tantrum and yells that she thought she was done with fuddy-duddy rituals, quote-unquote, when she left her home. Although visibly tense, Aang tells the group to keep moving as they are almost at the meadow. Jin Ying points to the town in front of them and asks if the meadow is just beyond the town. Aang is horrified when he reveals to the group that the town has been built on the meadow. Mm. Oh, boy. Progress. Uh huh. Little thing about Aang and Toph here. I actually love whenever, and we've actually talked about this with this comic series written by Yang. There is so many levels of subtext in the storytelling that makes it so engaging to read. And the thing I enjoy most about this issue is the fact that Aang and Toph are foils of each other right now mm. because Aang was allowed freedom in his childhood with Monk Gyatso 
Whereas Toph was kept inside and was restricted by her parents to the point where it was suppressive and she wasn't able to express herself at all until she was able to escape. So he sees the benefits in the traditions and upholding aspects of the culture. And then she's like, no, it's just oppressive. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. That didn't serve me at all. Yeah, it's very interesting. And this is like the first time where they're directly opposing each other other than at Earth Rumble 6. They're just... (laughs) at odds right now or during bitter work or bitter when work she was training him but that uh-huh. wasn't even like against each other necessarily they got i think a little upset but this is like this is more than just like a spat is what's happening right now and it's very interesting fundamental difference in opinion yeah and it's not one that could easily change either because they're both for lack of a better term stuck in their ways mm-hmm. which is actually kind of ironic because Toph does everything she does to not get stuck in ways period and now she's you know, she found herself very much in that with her own freedom. Mm-hmm. Oh, Toph, I love you so much. But geez, although Aang too, I'm just dissecting this all with my brain right now. Aang loves his past. Toph could do without hers. Yep. Again, with the whole storytelling concept, back with the conflict in Yu Dao, it's like no side is wrong. Each side has some validity. Same thing here. Each side has validity. Ooh, we took a nice little break from these, uh, from each side being right in the search to just come right back to it. Interesting. I wonder if this will be something that continues on through the other comics. Oh, undoubtedly. Huh. All right. Well, the group walks through the town and Aang is in shock because this was a very sacred place to the Air Nomads. Katara tries to explain that a lot can happen in 100 years, but the words don't really help in this situation. Toph and Sokka are delighted, however to smell meat in the air, and they rush off to find the source of the smell. Katara bumps into Nyok, an old friend and member of the Southern Water Tribe. Katara is surprised to see her friend in the Earth Kingdom, and Nyok tells Katara that her and her sister, Nutha, work in the refinery. Katara waves to Nutha, who only glares at the waterbender before yelling at her sister to return to their meal. Dun, dun, dun. Very weird. It's like, oh, hey, friend. Oh, hi, other friend. Other friend is like, I don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just going to walk away and let us wonder what that's all about until later. Mm-hmm. I still don't know why they're there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're not going to find out until part two or three, I'm sure. Well, I'll talk about it when it pops up in this one. But I think they like kind of explain it a little bit in a very general term. But it doesn't make sense to me. And we'll, when mm-hmm. we get to there, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. Aang sees another vision of Yang Chen behind the refinery. This time, she looks a bit more like a force ghost, for lack of a better term, but is still unable to speak to him. She waves and then disappears. Aang takes this as a sign, and the group walks up to the gate, and all of a sudden, everything just smells like rot. Aang earthbends everyone over the fence, where the smell is so much worse, and they see that the once sacred land has been polluted and defiled. Where's Captain Planet when you need him? I know. Jeez. I mean, they got all the elements there. They don't have heart. That's it. Uh, That's it. Suddenly, four earthbending guards appear and try to kick them out of the area for trespassing. And those guards look so much like Korra guards. Like, I saw their, like, get up. And I was like, that's from Legend of Korra. Uh Uh-huh. That is so cool. And I think that was intentional. I think that was a little Easter egg that Yang included, or Kurihiro, either one, to point towards another example of how this is a path leading to Korra. Mm -hmm. It was so appreciated because now when we get to Korra, it's going to seem less random and less like a jump. Uh Uh-huh. Same thing goes with the factory workers. The uniform that they wear is very similar to outfits that we see in Legend of Korra. That's right. Yes. Katara uses her water bending to block the earth bending attacks from the guards while Aang air bends the air acolytes to safety. Before Katara can defeat the guards with a massive wave, Aang stops her, realizing that this is yet another learning opportunity for the acolytes. Peace, he says, is at the very center of air nomad life. We don't engage in conflict unless absolutely necessary. And even then, things will often work themselves out just with the slightest nudge. Aang demonstrates this way of life by jumping out of the way of the incoming attacks and using his airbending to redirect the guards' attacks against one another so that they knock each other out. Smart. Very much reminiscent of that fight with Zhao, Mm -hmm. where he just used Zhao's own anger against him. Yep, until Zhao was setting fire to the whole collection of boats. Someone very recently was like, I don't like Zhao because he set fire to his own boat. And I was like, that's the point of Zhao. That's why you like him. Someone actually said that? 
someone said that somewhere. I don't remember who. And if it was someone that wrote in or something, I'm super sorry, but that just stuck with me. Or maybe it was someone that tuned in live with me. I don't remember. But I was like, that's the whole point is that he's so smart and collected until he's not. And then he has no control over himself and he just goes all out. And that was the point. Anyway. And he's a bull in a fire shop. I don't get to talk about Zhao very often because he's dead. <laughs> uh huh. But I just wanted to nerd out about Zhao again. And by the way, if, if anyone's wondering, I did get that pop figure with him holding the uh, the bag. Yeah. <laughs> it looks so cool. It's so good. Anyways, all of the action is suddenly interrupted when an individual yells from off panel, flying fire ferrets. That was amazing. A young man approaches the group who introduces himself as Satoru. He is honored to meet Aang and aggressively shakes his hand. He immediately recognizes Katara and shakes her hand with the exact same sense of vigor. The air acolytes introduce themselves and insist on bowing their heads as air nomads once did instead of getting their hands shaken horribly. <laughs> Yep, enthusiastically. Even Aang is standing there afterwards, like with his hand kind of out, hanging in the air, like, <laughs> what just happened to me? That was odd. I love this man. Yeah, I thought you'd like him. He's so pure and he's so funny. He just has that like energy that I love in my characters. Mm -hmm. Satoru tells Aang that he is the refinery's engineer and it's his uncle that actually runs the factory. However, with his uncle out of town, with his secret business partner, Satoru is in charge of the entire operation until they return. The engineer is clearly upset with the guards for attacking Team Avatar and glares at them as they return to their fleet. Aang asks to sit down with the engineer so they can talk about the refinery and where it's located. And all of a sudden, Satoru is in shock and exclaims that this is the best day of his life. Aang isn't quite sure what to make of this situation and Satoru's apparent fandom and tries to humble himself by saying that Aang wasn't alone in saving the world. It was a team effort. But when Satoru exclaims the name Toph Beifong, it is clear that his shock was not from having met the Avatar, but rather from meeting the savior of the world and discoverer of a brand new kind of bending that not even, by the way, not even Aang can do. Not even the Avatar can do. That little moment where she's like, ha, that's right. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Satoru offers to take the group on a tour of the Earth and Fire Refinery, to which Toph accepts on behalf of the group. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So have you noticed the design on his apron and also on the building? I did not. Tell me about it. I love this little concept because it's a visual depiction of what is happening here at the refinery. The nation's coming together. So the symbol that they're using on the refinery is the symbol of the Earth Kingdom, that like block of Earth that's kind of shaped in a pyramid mm. slash triangle, mm -hmm. except with the Fire Nation symbol of the flame on top of it. So they're fused together. That's so cool. That's such a nice little detail too. Mm -hmm. And apparently the name above the refinery it translates into Dirt Fire Company, which is fun. <laughs> Dirt Fire funny. Company. <laughs> That's very funny. During the tour, Satoru explains that his uncle had discovered the area to be rich with natural resources. But due to the political impact of the 100-year war, the Fire Nation citizen had to wait until after the end of the conflict to find himself an Earth Kingdom business partner to mine the land since it is on Earth Kingdom territory which is super messed up because mm -hmm. Aang inadvertently caused the sacred land to be desecrated. Yep. In by his bringing mind. peace to the world and ending the war. Yep. Interesting. This whole issue is just like uncomfortably yeah. similar to like real life yeah. and corporations <laughs> and consumerism and progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Aang does try to interject, but is unable to grab Satoru's attention. The engineer continues his story, proudly telling the gang that the refinery is the first joint business effort between the Earth Kingdom and the Fire Nation, which that is really cool, though. Mm hmm. And hence the symbol. Yep. Satoru brings everyone into a massive room filled with machinery and benders. He explains that there are jobs for everyone at the refinery, from firebenders heating giant furnaces to earth and water benders working to separate and purify rocks and gems. Which brings me to why Katara's friends are there. Hmm. Yep, let's hear it. They can't be waterbenders, right? Okay, I'm so glad you brought this up. <laughs> I actually thought the same thing 
and was confused because Katara is the last waterbender of the Southern Water Tribe. Right. So if she just saw her friends, they must have also been from the Southern Water Tribe, hence they couldn't be waterbenders. Yeah. But notice their outfits. Are they from Northern Water Tribe? No, I think the key is in their outfits. The benders in the refinery room are dressed in totally green outfits for earth benders and totally blue outfits for water benders. If you go back to her friends, they're dressed in a dark gray outfit with colored scarves around their neck. Oh. I don't think they're benders. I think they're working somewhere else in the, in the, in the refinery. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes so much more sense. I was just like, you can't. Like, I'm, like again, I can shoo some things under the rug, right? But that's uh -huh. not one thing I can really get her behind. Okay. Thank you. That makes me feel so much better. Yeah, I know. I was very concerned for a little bit until I realized <laughs> that visual distinction. <laughs> but also, I mean, that extends to Satoru too. He's dressed in mostly gray clothing. He doesn't have any like visual indication of a political allegiance or mm. depictions of like where he's from. He's very politically neutral by wearing those colors. His apron also shows the symbol of the refinery, showing that that is his like core allegiance. So again, like visuals informing the storytelling. Love it. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So now we got all that out of the way. We can get our heads around the fact that Katara is still the last waterbender of the Southern Water Tribe. Satoru continues the tour by showcasing a second assembly line to the group. And they are surprised to find it is completely automated so that even non-benders can work in the refinery. Sokka is impressed with the machinery and even exclaims that the machinist's workshop isn't even this advanced. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So anyone keeping track at home, there are now two technologically advanced forces in the Avatar world that don't know each other yet. So now in my brain, in my head canon, I can kind of get behind the advances in Korra a bit more now. Because if those two were to meet, then you would get a huge leap in technology, I would think. <laughs> like the machinist being brought on as a contractor? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he kind of was technically because he was under contract with the Fire Nation, was oh, giving them true. designs for different vehicles and like the hot air balloon and stuff. That's true. So I imagine that he either is already involved or will be involved very soon. Did you read ahead and you're just saying this as would be and then he no. actually shows up? Don't tease me with another, <laughs> no, no, no. With another sighting of him. I love him. I'm just saying it makes sense. It does. It, it does. makes sense. Absolutely does. The tour continues outside where Sokka practically hijacks a forklift and drives it around while Satoru tells the group about the refinery's expansion plans. The engineer is interrupted when Sokka tries to test the forklift speed limit and ends up breaking the thing. Oh, my God. Okay, pause real quick. So there is a note about that. Yang admires the comics of Don Rosa, who always incorporated jokes in his panel backgrounds. Yeah. So the pages where Satoru is taking Team Avatar on a tour and Katara steals Sokka's meat kebab in the background with mm -hmm. her water bending, And here where Sokka is going crazy with the forklift. That is Yang trying to reflect or imitate this technique. It's very well done. And it is very well it's done. It's something that also happened, I feel like, in the series proper. So, like, again, having that mimic itself in comic book form is usually it's Momo that's in the background being a clown yep. and just making me laugh. But having Sokka tool around on a forklift is very funny. <laughs> yeah. After taking a quick look at the engine, Satoru apologizes and tells everyone that he will have to ask someone else to continue and finish the tour as the forklift is pretty messed up and it's going to take him some time to figure it out. Toph, in a very tough manner, brushes the engineer aside and is able to use her metal bending and seismic sense together to see every part of the machine precisely and is able to fix the machine in seconds. I don't know if she's using her seismic sense. I'm just saying that because it just makes sense to me that she would she combine is. those two. It just felt right. Yeah. We didn't see that visual depiction, but in my head canon, that's what it is. Yeah, it's like it's grayscale. So that usually means that it is her seismic sense. The difference is in the past, the seismic sense has come with vibrations, which yeah. are like the ripples of white. But this is just gray. So yeah, I still think it counts. I kind of read that as being gray as it's just metal. Dark. Yeah, it's dark <laughs> yeah. and it's metal. But yes. Okay. Satoru is impressed, but Toph brushes it off and tells the engineer that really any of her novice metal bending students would be able to pull off the repair. The two work out a business arrangement where Satoru will build housing for her students, and in return, her students will help work at the refinery and fix the machines. I have moral objections to this personally. Her students helping with the machines? 
because it's free labor that they're not even agreeing to <laughs> necessarily. Oh, she's like volunteering her students. Yeah. She's vol <laughs> yeah, she's, that's exactly what she does. She's going to volunteer them to go fix machinery and she is profiting and they're not. It's just weird. Well, I mean, the building's going to profit everyone, but I get what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about like the hourly labor that it's going to take across time and them not being compensated. Yeah. Kind of weird. Yeah. Although I guess she's not taking money for them to learn metal bending. So maybe that's just like, I don't know. It just kind of left me with a weird feeling. That's all. We also learn here that Toph has a little bit of a crush on the engineer. And Sokka notes the serious boogiosity going on between the two. Katara thinks it's sweet to see Toph's softer side. Yeah. So this exchange is very much something that you would see in a movie or a show where two strangers meet, two characters, mm -hmm. and they have an exchange where one does something that the other either recognizes, relates to, or enjoys, and then they respond. And then that person's like, oh my gosh, you too? And then they go back and forth a little bit and the camera cuts to each of their faces until they finally finish their conversation, usually in a rushed state, and then stare at each other in like recognition and like going, oh, you. Yeah. Like that's exactly what's happening here. <laughs> I like it. It's cute. It's only really happening on Toph's end, though. I think it's on his side, too. I don't know, though, because she's... He was fanboying all over her. He obviously knows who she is and appreciates and respects her. But I don't think it's in a romantic sense. I think it's just in like a... Yeah. He admires her, but not like admires... Admi you know what I mean? Right. Yes, I think so. And then she's like, well, also, I think with Toph, it's less of a crush crush. And more like, uh, you're not useless. That means I like you. Oh, I did not read it that way. I read it as uh, like she has a like a young crush on him. I think the young crush is forming, but most of okay. it is that. Yeah. Interesting. Like, Interesting. you don't suck. Therefore, you're I like terrible. you. <laughs> <laughs> Aang suddenly notices Yang Chen's spirit again and has a vision of a monstrous creature made of earth and metal destroying the settlement which kind of reminded me of the boar metal suit that we saw in oh, the search. Oh, it does a little bit. Uh-huh. A little more like ethereal and like kind of magic-y, but it gave me that vibe. Aang is unable to decipher if this is a vision of what is to come or a vision of what has already occurred. He asks the spirit of Yang Chen to clarify, but she disappears. This vision strengthens Aang's determination to speak to Satoru, and he explains to the engineer that the refinery should not have been built on land that was sacred to the air nomads. Before Satoru can respond, Toph interrupts her new crush, when I'm saying is a crush, but you may not agree, but I think it's a crush, and tells Aang that the area was abandoned for 100 years and that Satoru and his uncle had every right to build here. Aang tries to explain that Yang Chen has been trying to warn them of an incoming danger, but when Toph asks for more information, Aang is unable to provide any. Toph rolls her eyes and brushes off his concerns, and Aang tries to explain that something bad has already happened to this land. Katara backs him up and reminds the group of the River of Sludge that they saw earlier. Satoru acknowledges the defiled state of the water, but claims that the refinery was not responsible for that. No one believes him until Toph puts her hand on his chest and asks him to repeat himself, using her seismic sense to detect a possible lie. When she claims Satoru is telling the truth, she is pulled aside by Aang, who uses poorly chosen words to figure out if her crush is affecting her perception of the engineer, which mm -hmm. you never want to do that with Toph or anyone. Yep. Are you sure your emotions aren't just in control of you right now? Are you sure your emotions aren't blinding? Oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Toph throws the sentiment back in his face, however, and shows Aang the benefits of the refinery. People from all over the world work side by side every day in harmony, and all Aang wants to do is tear the place down because of some, quote, stupid backwards holiday. It's very interesting that Aang worked so hard with the group in the promise to bring balance to the world. And he is so against what the result of that balance is in the rift. Yeah, because in the rift, it's directly affecting his personal identity and his past. Yeah, that's his weakness. That's his blind spot. Yeah, going with the being blinded by things. That is his weakness. So if he is going to be gung-ho and super positive and supportive of the nations coming together in places like Yudao, but when it's in places like this that are directly affecting things of his past, then he's like, no, not cool at all whatsoever. Yeah. Well, it goes to show that 
his mentality hasn't really changed all that much from the promise. Like we assumed it did because I don't know, he seemed to be okay with it in the search. But just as a reminder to everyone, Aang was very much keep the square pegs in the square holes and the round pegs in the round holes. And it was Zuko who was like, no, well, like, let's meld these together mm-hmm. and we get something better. And eventually Aang was like, yeah, this is great. But you can tell right here that he didn't think that all the way through. So his mind, he says, yeah, let's meld everything except mine. Don't mm-hmm. you touch mine. <laughs> yep. Granted, this is an extreme example where this is like the land is defiled. It's not just like they're using it for the purposes. It's just decimated Mm -hmm. nearly beyond recognition but to your point it does show degrees of growth he's not quite there yet he's He's not completely yeah he's still wrapped up in his development and his acceptance of this new turn of events yeah ang does not take this whole shoving logic in his face very well as the two immediately butt heads until the ground rumbles beneath their feet katara and Sokka run over pleading for them to calm down as they are scaring the workers Aang tells the group that he's not responsible for the earth rumbling and heavily implies that it was Toph's doing. Toph is super offended by this implication and tells the group that she can control her bending. The earth rumbles again, this time a lot more forcefully, and even knocks over some of the crates and crystals nearby. Aang offers to help clean up the mess, but Satoru asks that they leave as his uncle will be back shortly with his business, with his secret business partner. and he doesn't want to risk any more incidents. The group hears cries for help coming from inside the refinery, and they run in to find that the automated machine has gone crazy and is launching rocks inside the factory. While Katara and Sokka work to clear everyone from the area, Toph and Aang find that an old man is trapped underneath some metal debris. As they move in, Satoru shouts that there's a power cord they can unplug to shut down the machine. Toph completely ignores them, as Toph does, and she punches the machine, reducing it to rubble. Oh, yeah, and Aang, if anyone's wondering, Aang does save the old man because he's the Avatar and he can very easily do that. He does so by using earthbending. And also, as they're making their way to the man to save him, did you notice that Toph headbutts a rock? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah. She's so hard-headed in so many ways. Yep. With the threat now subdued, Aang and Toph apologize to one another for their comments earlier. Toph asks her friend if he is trying too hard to hold on to the past, to which Aang agrees that he might be. When Aang asks if Toph is trying a little too hard to run away, Toph tells her friend that not everybody has a good past, and some people have to run away just to live. Oof. Yeah. That's some true words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) I do really like, just pausing for a moment, I do really like that they were so easily able to cast aside their differences to help people. Yep. They're angry at themselves, but they haven't lost themselves in this anger, which is very nice. Yeah. They fell into, I mean, actually, that was very like Marvel Avengers moment for me. Yeah. You can have your your squabbling and your fights, but then when you roll out and you're doing your job, then mm-hmm. you have to work as a team and you just kind of fall back into that role. Yeah. It's very good to see. I really liked it. Toph and Aang's conversation is interrupted by the arrival. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> of Colonel Monk and the Rough Rhinos. I did look. I did not see that archer. Oh, really? I did not see Vakir. I was looking for him. They only show three. The guy with the braided ponytail and then the guy with the helmet. Yeah, no Vakir. Poor guy. Yeah. What if they kicked him out because he wasn't good enough? Oh, man. What if like he failed one too many times oh. and they kicked him out of the Rough Rhinos? They're uh-huh. like, you're supposed to be a Union archer. And you can't Uh take down 13-year-olds. You're out of the rough rhinos. (laughs) I wonder. Oh, man. Aang immediately assumes a defensive position against the rough rhinos, asking what they're doing at the refinery. But Monk informs them that the rough rhinos were hired by the owner and his secret partner of the refinery to be their personal security guards. At that moment, Satoru's uncle, whose name is Loban, walks into the factory and demands an explanation from Satoru for the state of his building. And also that super expensive automated machine, which costs, I don't remember how much they said exactly, but it was like an absurd amount. Uh, Yeah, he said it was 10,000 bon. Yeah, that's too much. That was a lot of bon right there. When Satoru cannot provide a decent explanation, Loban turns to his secret business partner, who's only a silhouette at this point. Oh, my God. They didn't hype this up as much in the comic as you are now. (laughs) (laughs) 
I didn't even see it coming because it was just like random so passive references. <laughs> yeah. That's my only criticism of this comic is this reveal that's coming up in the next two sentences should have been a much larger reveal than what it actually was. Oh, I thought it was a big reveal. But like, not really. I mean, it, well, it is a big reveal, but like it could have been more drawn out i think to make me like mm. really be like who is the secret business partner because they never like i'm just like secret business partner but it's always just like oh yeah his partner don't worry about it his partner yeah so satoru cannot provide a decent explanation for kind of what happened and loban kind of turns to his partner and tells him that he knew his nephew would be too scatterbrained to shoulder any real responsibility loban's partner does not react to the outburst but instead steps forward out of the shadows, with a face blank as he looks at Toph, who immediately recognizes the man. His name is Lao Beifang. And yes, that's the same Lao Beifang that is her father. Dun, dun, bum, dun. Bum, the <laughs> end. Now that I said that, my point is that Loban goes, Lao, yeah, come here. It just says like very calmly. And then Lao steps mm -hmm. out and it's this whole big reveal. But like he shouldn't have even said Lao or they should have been dropping breadcrumbs, I think, all the way through. To let us know. Mm, mm -hmm. Well, it's also been long enough that I didn't remember her dad's name. Yeah. So we see Lao too before Loban says his name, but it didn't mean anything to me, <laughs> to be honest with yeah. you. Because I too forgot. Yep. Because we've only seen him like a handful of times. Mm -hmm. But the impact of the reveal is what gets me because yeah. Toph has not seen her family since she left home. That's right. I think she may have seen her mom and dad like one time, but I don't even know. They tricked her in book three into going home. Shin Fu and Master Yu and, and uh, Fu, yeah. Master Yu gave her a note saying like, we are your parents. Come see us, blah, blah, blah. And then it was a trap. So I don't think she's even seen her parents since she left home. Yeah. My gut is telling me that she must have, but I think like, I can't think of why. I think it's just me being me. <laughs> and being like, that can't be. Yeah. Knowing Toph, she would also like put something like that off for years. That is very true. Absolutely. Well, anyways, that is The Rift Part 1. Mm. And I think we know what The Rift is between, and it sounds like it's going to be between Toph and Aang, which is very cool. Uh, it's going to be a couple things. The Rift is working on multiple layers here. Oh, and also The Rift in the environment. Mm hmm The rift between Toph and her family and Toph and her past. That's true. Which actually, there is a note about that. Yang mentioned that the story of what happened with Toph's parents is arguably the second biggest dangling thread left by the series. And so it was pretty intimidating to address. But so far, I really like the way that they're incorporating it into the story. Me too. Yeah, because we also get to see what Toph's dad does for a living. Uh-huh. Yeah. We'll explain how he gets all of his money. I'm going to say this. I really, really hope, probably not going to happen, but I hope we find out what happened to Master Yu and Shinfu. Yeah. Even if it's just a mention, that would be great. Even just a mention, just something. Give me something. That's all I want. Hmm. Speaking of things that I want, and I think all of our listeners want as well, Acorn, as always, I need to know who is your MVP of the episode or of the issue. Okay. I have a really silly one. Okay. This is going to be a silly one. I don't do silly ones very often, but... This issue I thought was very balanced with everyone's roles. So no one really stood out to me as a major MVP. Everyone kind of had their thing going on. Mm -hmm. Toph and Aang had their own things. The Air Acolytes were supporting characters. Katara was a supporting girlfriend. Sokka was the comedic relief. And Satoru was the new guy who is ushering in the new future for this world. So everyone like had their thing, but no one really stood out to me. Except for one. Mm -hmm. One character who we didn't even mention this episode. Jingbo. Jingbo. He was very funny. <laughs> Jingbo. He's very funny. Jingbo is the youngest air acolyte that's been tagging along this whole time. And he is the quiet strength in the background, the supporting corner of the whole group, <laughs> the little kid who's shouldering all of their supplies and the pride of being an air acolyte on his shoulders. I think he's the MVP, the unsung MVP of this issue. It's very easy to group all the air acolytes together. And I kind of did that because I was just like, they're just all being pals. But I agree. He's literally carrying all the heavy lifting. He's doing it <laughs> happily, by the way, happily. Uh-huh. And he is, he's kind of like Aang almost in a sense. And like, I don't know, I just get Aang vibes off of him. Yep. You know, from book one, like when he's kind of just like happy to be around and all that. I think in the traditional sense for me, 
I think Avatar Yang Chen is the MVP because she literally moves the plot along and gets everyone where they need to go. However, let's just give her like a half point or something because I got to give my boy Satoru the MVP because uh, yeah. he's hilarious. He's so enthusiastic. He's got this like naivete about him that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. And he's not afraid to like just be a fanboy, to just <laughs> be excited and be in the yeah. moment. And it's just very cool. It's very like refreshing because we don't really get that from the gang too much anymore. Yeah, he does wear his emotions on his sleeve. He was very expressive. He's very good. I like that. Yeah. What's your moral of the issue? I kind of feel like it's simply don't do things without meaning. Hmm. Like we're seeing Aang cling to his traditions, but without understanding what they really mean. To him, they mean home and they mean familiarity and they mean memories. But beyond that, he doesn't really have a meaning attached to it. On the flip side, Satoru is starting this refinery with immense meaning. He's like, I want to build something new. I want to push this world forward. I want to bring all of the world together, all of the nations working alongside each other. I want to, you know, pave the way for our future. And he has immense meaning in the refinery. So I, I feel like, yeah, it's just do things with meaning or Interesting. don't blindly do things without meaning. Flash, make sure you do things with meaning. Awesome. I think for me, the moral that I got out of this issue, there are a couple that kind of came to mind, but I think the butterfly effect is the one that kind of like stood out to me the most. Like everything that you do has a rippling effect throughout the world. You may be able to see them. You may not be able to see it, but it's changing something, which I thought was very interesting with the whole by Aang restoring balance, he unknowingly caused a chain of events that led to the desecration of the sacred site. Mm -hmm. It's very cool that they're incorporating that kind of like longevity to the Avatar universe. And I'm sure it'll just keep on going as we get into the end of the comics and Korra and... I'm wondering if they'll sprinkle in some of this with the books like Kiyoshi and Yang Chen, because the Yang Chen book just came out not too long ago. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited about that. We have another book to cover. So I'm hoping that we get some of that and, you know, just like little things here or there just that we can Mm -hmm. see. Oh, yeah, this turned into this and the last airbender and then went into Korra. I'm really looking for that thread that goes through everything. We'll see. I don't know if we'll get it or not, but we'll see. Hmm. Good moral. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's the episode. That is all of the material and time we have for now until not next week, but the week after. So if you're caught up on all the episodes, like a couple of our reviewers were, and you're looking to hang out a little bit, maybe watch the games, hang out, listen to music, have some laughs. You can join me over at twitch.tv slash booster Greg on Monday and Friday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are almost done with the entire Darksiders series. We're taking a quick break at the moment to play In Sound Mind, which is a uh, survival horror game, which is really neat. It's got psychological stuff. It's so cool. It's very spooky. It's got a moral to, I mean, I've only played one chapter so far, but there's a blatant moral to it. It's really cool. So come on over, hang out. Love to have you. And you can find me online at Acorn Bandits or on joysons.com slash Joyson Studio on Etsy, where you can find our enamel pins. That's right. Coming up next time. The Rift Part 2. That's right. And we'll see you next time on Avatar, Avatar the, the Podcast. Podcast. Avatar, the podcast, is a proud part of the Geek Generation Network. Remember to check out all of our podcasts at thegeekgeneration.com. 